Hi Nana, this is Richard here. Can you hear me okay? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Great, excellent. We're going to start the event uh, very shortly and so uh, I'm glad you can hear us loud and clear and uh, we'll uh, look forward to hearing from you, okay? All right. Great, thanks. All right, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to CSIS. I'm Johanna Nesseth. I'm Vice President for Strategic Planning and also co-directing a project that we are uh, undertaking on uh, development, looking at all aspects of development and how the U.S. uses uh, all aspects of our smart power, including our private sector, in uh, promoting economic development internationally. So I'm glad to welcome you all to talk about a topic that is big, it's complicated, it's difficult, um, but it's really, really crucial to economic growth uh, in many, many countries. Uh, we're talking about land titling. We've got a great set of people here with us. Uh, Bryn Fosberg is with Trimble, a company that's been using GPS and other kinds of technology uh, for different approaches to land titling. Benjamin Linkow, who's uh, the land tenure uh, economist at USAID. I understand that he is one of the leading experts in this subject. Jolene Sanjak, who is so the person I've always thought of as a leading expert on land, te uh, land titling and tenure, who was with MCC for a long time and is now with a nonprofit called Landesa. And we're very happy to welcome you, Nana Amayura, by video from Ghana, to talk about the Ghana uh, experience and I hope explore some of the new approaches and positive um, impacts. Richard Downey, who is the Deputy Director of our Africa Program, will moderate the discussion. We'll have uh, comments and discussion from our panelists, and then we'll open up to uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Joanna. Welcome, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all uh, on this uh, very cold afternoon uh, to talk about land and all the complicated issues uh, surrounding it. I, I think uh, to just to frame the issue a little bit, it's recognized uh, by many development experts now that uh, unclear or uh, contested rules on land ownership and land use are, are major impediments to uh, economic growth. Uh, many reasons for this, I'm not going to go into all of them, our speakers will I'm sure explain some of them. But one of the most basic is that you know, people are less likely to, vote, to devote time, uh, money and energy investing in their land or the property on their land uh, if there's a risk that someone else might uh, try to take it away from, uh, from them or challenge them. Uh, even if they wish to uh, do so, uh, there's other in, uh, important obstacles that uh, stand in the way of uh, people uh, making money from their land. Uh, people who don't have secure land tenure or legal title to their land uh, often can't put up the land as collateral and therefore find it difficult to uh, borrow money for the investments uh, they wish to make. Um, and of course Africa, which is the region I work on here at CSIS, is one of the uh, places in the world where the rules governing land are most complex and most uh, uh, opaque. Uh, what's more, land, and probably for this reason, land is a very uh, contested resource uh, with multiple claims and the absence of documentation uh, as to who owns what uh, or who has the right to use the land. Uh, now in, this, in these circumstances, uh, the rights of smallholder farmers uh, or sharecroppers often get swept aside uh, in favour of the wealthy uh, and the well-connected uh, governments or even increasingly uh, foreign investors uh, who in some cases uh, are taking advantage of the confusion uh, to snap up uh, some prime land in, in Africa. Uh, the lack of land titling also uh, creates major problems for governments. Uh, of course, without accurate knowledge of the value of land and who owns it, it's very difficult for governments to set up functioning and efficient uh, tax systems uh, and therefore make the necessary investments in public services. So the uh, big question then we're asking this afternoon is this, you know, how do we remove uh, some of these barriers uh, to clarity on land ownership uh, and land use? So really that land can be used and harnessed more effectively as a means of spurring economic development. So as Johanna mentioned, we have a great set of panelists to help us uh, answer this question, uh, representing very diverse uh, backgrounds, uh, both in public and private uh, and the nonprofit sector, uh, oftentimes uh, using technology and other innovative uh, methods to, uh, to help uh, crack this very, very tricky uh, issue. And to help us get our heads around what is a very uh, complex uh, set of issues, we're going to focus a little bit on uh, one particular uh, case study this afternoon uh, from Ghana as well. Uh, and we're really glad we have Nana joining us from, from Ghana to help us uh, explain the issues there. So let me start off really by turning to uh, 
uh, Dr. Sanjak, uh, perhaps to frame the issue uh, for us really, um, you know, you spent your uh, career working on uh, land rights in both public and private sectors, um, now at uh, Landesa, uh, previously uh, the MCC. Um, perhaps explain to us, if you can, uh, the, some of the key opportunities that uh, strengthening land rights uh, presents for economic uh, development, uh, and of course, what are some of the barriers that have to be overcome uh, as well? Sure. Um, and actually, I think you do quite a nice job of framing the issue at a big picture level. And I think I'll just add a little bit of flavor to that in the economic sphere and then touch on some other spheres of development that the same problems with land rights affect and with, with the lens that it's a, if it's a constraint today, unlocking that constraint would turn it into an opportunity. So in the arena of economic growth and poverty reduction, um, you, you touched on you know, the fact that when people gain secure rights to land and when the lack of clarity that exists in the legal framework governing land rights and when the costs associated with doing transactions in land go down, people will tend to make better choices, choices that yield increases in productivity, that yield income increases, that improve livelihoods. Um, you touched on those sorts of things. I think there's a new literature coming out that's quite interesting that we haven't often stopped to think about and that is showing, uh, for example, that uh, there are nutrition benefits that one sees when particularly women get access to secure land rights. Um, there are educate, you know, children's school attendance um, tends to increase. There are some studies in Argentina and a few other places that are showing positive impacts on <coughs> securing land rights and education, uh, access to education systems. And these are important variables that feed right back into poor people and their avenue to economic opportunity. Um, I think I also like to stress that this um, area of secure land rights is vital for the poorest of the poor, and Lend Us as an organization focuses on the most vulnerable. Um, but it's also vitally important for the driver of growth, the private sector, and the, the economic engine in and of itself, which ultimately creates jobs for those same poor people. Um, I'll just give one anecdote. When I was working for MCC and we were in Mozambique, I was talking to a lawyer who uh, served fairly big commercial clients that were investing in Mozambique. And she was telling me anecdote after anecdote that kind of summed up to the cost of starting a business that required a piece of property to do the business on in Mozambique were something like 90% higher because of all the run around the red tape and the lack of security around land rights and trying to find solutions to that. So it's important for the poorest of the poor and we need to start there but realize also that it's important for the macro growth picture and investment climate as well. Um, a lot of literature on the implications of land rights for environmental stewardship and investment in conservation and uh, reforestation and those, those sorts of things. Um, it's the same kind of incentive story that when people have secure land rights, they've got a longer term interest and they're more likely to make right choices. I want to turn to something that many of you might not have th thought about, but the problems that you described with land rights are also really important in the context of disasters, both man-made, like wars, um, and natural disasters. And I want to just talk about two real quick examples. One, my uh, colleague um, uh, Doug Batson is here in the audience, and I was going to mention you before I knew you were going to be here. So, <laughs> But I think if, if you have a chance to chat with Doug, Doug was in the military and probably still is, but um, wrote a fascinating book coming out of his experiences in Afghanistan on how the lack of attention to insecure and unclear land rights was really getting in the way of achieving stabilization in that post-war context. In El Salvador, there was an earthquake in 1996, and the fact that the government of El Salvador had paid attention to these issues and created good information about land records made it vastly easier for them to come up with a housing reconstruction plan than it is today in Haiti, for example, where I understand the, there is some attention to these issues, but it's certainly getting in the way. So, this is important in that sphere of development as well. And finally, just to touch quickly on social inclusion and empowerment, a lot of evidence um, that particularly giving rights to women lead to things like increase in their voice in their households, their voice in their communities, and the corresponding changes in outcomes with regard to children's nutrition, children's education, some of the things I mentioned before. Um, even recently, there's some studies coming out showing that giving women access to secure land rights has an impact on domestic violence. So I think that's a, a new arena. There is a lot of positive 
rigorous evidence starting to come out documenting these things. But I, I always like to tell people also just, you know, I've been in the business for long enough. People like Emmy Simmons have been here around the block a few times. You know, back, back in the early 1990s, um, really this issue went off the radar screen. People stopped paying attention to it. Structural adjustment came in, markets were going to work. And then it sort of got in the way. At, in one arena after the other, whether it was investment, whether it was productivity, whether it was food security, environment, post-conflict management. And so there's a lot of econometric evidence coming out. There's also a lot of anecdotal evidence of how it can get in the way. So we need to pay attention to it. Um, having said that, final point I would like to make, just in kind of the overarching framing, is that despite everything I just said, it's not a panacea. Right? We all need to take pause and realize that some of these outcomes depend on what else is going on in the context. So I like to talk about credit. People um, often talk about how if you have a land title, you can get credit. And that's true where the banking system is working and when, where there are bankable deals. On the other hand, if a farmer doesn't have anything that will help generate income and the banking system isn't lending anyway, having a land title isn't going to get you very far. So just a word of caution that there are other elements in the, in the development of a place that need to be happening for the uh, rewards from secure land rights to be borne out. Um, and then I, I think, uh, do you want me to talk about some a couple of challenges in the, in the arena, or is that? Some well, let's, let's outline a couple of, just a couple of headline challenges, and then we'll, uh, we'll ask okay. uh, uh, Nana as well from her sort of on the ground perspective. Okay, so as I see it, there are the, the, the three key challenges of today, and these challenges have been around, but they're front and center today, and they're front and center both in the sense that they're real and we need to address them if we want our program interventions to succeed, but they're also uh, present in the sense that people are starting to pay attention to them, so that's the good news. And maybe uh, Trimble, the uh, speaker from Trimble also can talk about this, but one of them is in the area of technologies and cost effectiveness. Um, a good land titling system also has a mapping basis that, that documents the physical boundaries of property, and we still have not gotten to the point where we can say we truly have a cost effective approach that is scalable to the technology side, both of the information systems that constitute a registry of property rights and the um, mapping system. We're getting there, but it still needs attention. Um, and that feeds right into the question of whether the donor programs that are helping to put in place secure rights are sustainable. Um, some really exciting stuff on the innovative front. On the other hand, I let my colleagues talk about that, um, that stand to make the outcomes even better. A second challenge is in the area, particularly in Africa, of really figuring out how to harmonize customary rules and norms around land tenure with statutory. So what's in the formal governmental books and what's the on the ground reality in these customary and tribal areas. There's some really exciting things going on in places like Benin and Burkina Faso and Ghana along these lines, but it's still a challenge area that we need to work on. And the final one is to really get the land rights equation understood in the context of the quote unquote global land grab. Um, most of you have probably seen the media attention to the large amounts of land that are being acquired for private sector investment. And when I look at that, I look back and I say, really, at the root cause of all that uh, concern is the basic issue that people don't have their rights documented in the first place. So transactions can't happen with good governance. So we need to get that understood and get out ahead of that. Great. Well, that's a fantastic overview to get us uh, started. Let, let's go over to uh, Nana Amayira, who's uh, joining us, uh, taking her evening off uh, to join us uh, from Ghana. Thanks so much for uh, being with us. Uh, uh, Nana, you're the uh, Chief Executive of Officer of uh, Colindef, which start, uh, stands for the Community Land and Development uh, Foundation, uh, a Ghana-based NGO. Um, perhaps you could explain a little bit about uh, what Colin Def does and then uh, give us the, your perspective uh, from the Ghanaian uh, standpoint and, and, and you know, in, broad, in very broad terms explain some of the uh, complexities, uh, problems uh, over land ownership and land tenure in Ghana and, and why you think it's important that this issue is, is dealt with uh, in terms of Ghana's uh, economic development. Was that the moment we lost? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you there? Can you hear us? No. I think uh, I have to call on the, uh, some technical assistance from uh, some, one of my colleagues here and, and uh, perhaps skip Nana for the moment and, and go over to, to you, Ben. Um, 
talking about the, the USAID uh, perspective, one of the things that you've been uh, working on, you're a member of an interagency uh, working group that's been looking at the land tenure uh, and specifically at Ghana as well. So while we wait to hear back from uh, Nana, perhaps you could uh, talk a little bit about the work that you've been uh, doing there and how, from your point of view, uh, land tenure insecurity is, is you know, holding back ec economic growth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me, uh, let me start by giving you a little bit of background on the broader process that our uh, interagency working group came out of, and that was the Partnerships for Growth Initiative. Uh, the Partnerships for Growth Initiative uh, came out of the Presidential Policy Directive on Global Development, and the idea is for the United States and partner countries to sit down and sort of engage in an in-depth, collaborative, uh, rigorous kind of process to really look at the evidence, look at the, uh, the whole economy of these countries, and, and figure out what the priorities should be and figure out what, do, what we see as the, uh, the uh, overall constraints to economic growth. And the four, um, the four countries that are initially participating are Ghana, Tanzania, El Salvador, and the Philippines. So we all know uh, Ghana has experienced pretty healthy economic growth over the last 10 years. But the task of the Partnerships for Growth team was to really think about why hasn't this growth been faster? What could be done to increase the rate of economic growth and hence uh, poverty reduction? And so um, uh, the, following this, this sort of lengthy process involving people from different US government agencies, people from uh, uh, different uh, ministries in the government of Ghana, the three constraints that the, uh, the team identified were uh, access to credit, uh, electricity, right, Un unreliability of the, uh, the power supply, and then the third one was insecure land tenure, right? So I mention this because I, I want you to understand that the conclusion of this rigorous analysis, right, was that insecure land tenure was one of the top three issues in terms of uh, uh, things that are happening in Ghana that get in the way of, of economic growth. Okay, so why is that? What are the, what are the mechanisms by which <coughs> insecure land tenure inhibits economic growth? Well, I'll, I'll flesh out a little bit some of, the, uh, some of the points that Richard and Jolene have already raised. Um, but basically, we, we see sort of three main avenues. One of them is, is in terms of investment from small-scale farmers. The second is in terms of land transactions. And then the third is in terms of other broader kinds of investment. So probably most importantly is the first one, and that's that insecure land tenure deters investment for millions of small-scale farmers in Ghana. Right? And as, as Richard said, this is, this is because uh, when somebody might, might uh, take your land or when your, your claim to land is subject to challenge, it weakens your, in, your incentive to invest. Um, and particularly in Ghana, uh, we're, we're talking, when we talk about what are these investments, we're talking about things like investing in higher value tree crops, right? things that might take a longer time to pay off. Uh, we're talking about small scale irrigation investments investments in soil conservation. And one that the, that the research has really shown is important, particularly in Ghana, is fallowing, right? So uh, th there was a, a paper that showed a pretty large impact of tenure insecurity on reducing agricultural productivity by reducing the incidence of fallowing. And the reason for that is that if you leave your land fallow, then it's more subject to claims by other people. Your tenure over it is less secure. And so as a result of that, people don't fallow their land as often as they would from a purely productivity maximizing perspective. OK, so, so that's, the, that's the, the first issue. The second is in terms of land transactions. And what we mean by that is that when we have insecure land tenure, the distribution of land is not as efficient as it might otherwise be. Right? And, and so you might imagine uh, a household that's got lots of labor and is looking to um, uh, uh, expand the area that it cultivates may want to buy or rent land from another household that doesn't have as much labor or another household where people are migrating to the city or something like that. Right? But if the, the second household doesn't have secure land tenure, that kind of transaction can't take place. Okay? Similarly, um, rental markets are, are very important in Ghana where Again, households that may not have as much land as they'd be able to cultivate uh, rent land in order to increase their holdings and increase their output. Um, but when, when rights aren't secure, right, these rental transactions don't take place. And particularly in Ghana, there's often concerns that uh, the, the renter of the land is then going to try to assert permanent rights because the person who, who owns the land doesn't have a, a clear and, and demonstrable uh, claim to the land, so that's an issue. And, and the bottom line here with, these, with land transactions is that we, we see a situation where people who could use the land the most productively aren't able to access it. 
Okay? And then finally, the third, uh, the third avenue here is in other kinds of investments. Um, one of the, one of the um, things that we looked at in our, in our interagency working group was a study of uh, foreign investors who identified uh, access to land as the number one constraint that they face when operating in Ghana. Okay, so the number one problem for foreign investors in Ghana, according to the investors themselves, is accessing land. And obviously, if investors aren't able to access land in one country, they're going to go somewhere else. Okay? Um, this is also a difficulty for Ghanaian investors. Also, there's a lot that's been written about the land grab phenomenon in a lot of African countries, as Jolene touched on, these large-scale land transactions where uh, uh, sometimes uh, local people are being displaced by larger commercial operators. And, and we believe that one of the best defenses against these kinds of abuses is when the people on the ground have clear and secure land rights. Okay, so those three things are, are sort of the main uh, mechanisms by which we see uh, land tenure insecurity as a constraint to economic growth in Ghana. Thanks very much, Ben. Let's turn to, uh, to you, uh, Bryn. Uh, work, you've worked for Trimble, a company uh, that's investing, working in, in Ghana, uh, in fact, all over, all over the world, and using technology uh, to help address uh, uh, clarity on land, uh, uh, really mainly by doing land surveys. But perhaps you could t tell us uh, really what work Trimble is doing in Ghana and how as a private company you're able to sort of plug into uh, uh, these big developments uh, objectives while of course uh, making money as well. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, at Trimble when we move into a new economy or a new market uh, we really look at four pillars um, and uh, we really need to satisfy those four pillars we believe to reach success. Uh, one being collaboration. Uh, so we believe collaboration is essential to be to meet project goals um, as well as corporate goals. Second is uh, education. Uh, third, investment, and fourth, patience. Uh, and we really look at all four of those, whether we're doing work in Laos or whether we're do doing work in Tanzania or Benin or Burkina Faso or Ghana. Specifically to Ghana, um, uh, we we looked at working in collaboration with both the public and private sector for our own education and to determine what the requirements uh, were from a land administration perspective. Uh, we, we ended up working with our uh, local partner, uh, CAD Consult, who is in Accra, as well as uh, with our corporate, our, our corporate um, partner being Medin, to really look at um, what were the requirements from a land administration perspective, primarily related to field data collection or to the surveying aspect uh, of land administration. Uh, as a group, we then worked uh, with the uh, Ghana Land Commission to determine what those requirements are and really validate those and then look at our product portfolio on what our current product portfolio uh, could do to actually support uh, the land administration process in, in Ghana. From that, uh, by looking at our portfolio, we, we looked at our GNSS or our navigation, our satellite navigation system or our infrastructure system as a, a potential way to put in a backbone of geodetic control that could be used for land titling. Uh, then in uh, 2008, uh, along with uh, MCC, uh, we worked uh, on a project, uh, a pilot project in central Ghana, uh, where roughly 1,182 titles uh, were established. So we, we really find collaboration as one, one key pillar. Education is essential. I think uh, we as a group have to concentrate more on education, both the public and private sector. Um, education ensures reuse of the technology after the project is over. Uh, we all spent a lot of time on the project and, and uh, applaud the project, uh, but uh, really we, we leave behind an infrastructure that we want to be reused. So from an educational process, um, we actually worked uh, with the Science and Technology University in Kumasi, where we actually donated equipment so the surveyors of the future could utilize that technology and be fluent in that technology uh, as, they, as they left school. In addition, we worked with the uh, Ghana Institution of Surveyors as well so that the current surveying populace 
was fluent with the technology and also understood what those advantages were from a, a technology perspective. I think a third pillar being investment. I think if you want any return, you have to invest. Uh, that's, uh, that, that applies to government, that applies to business. Uh, we made uh, significant investments uh, in Ghana and in the region and the African continent. Um, we opened up an office in Accra. Uh, we hired local surveyors, local geodesists, local engineers to support not only the projects within Ghana, but uh, the entire West Africa region. Uh, and they're currently supporting Nigeria uh, and Burkina Faso. Uh, so uh, investment is is essential. Um, investment is also essential just from a training perspective to provide that localized training beyond the project. Because I think many times we look at just a project, but beyond the project is what provides sustainability for both the uh, private, private and public uh, sector. Um, lastly, I think patience. Uh, I think you, you uh, uh, whether it be Africa or whether it be Laos, or it's different than uh, where uh, the Western world is usually work, used to working. So things like challenges in power, challenges in, in customs, whether it be uh, cultural customs or administrative customs, power in communications, power in uh, logistics, all of those things are, are challenges. And uh, I think the last thing from a public sector is uh, you actually have more to learn than to give. And uh, I think what, what we've learned through our work in uh, Burkina and Nigeria and Tanzania as well as Ghana is a, we've learned a lot. I think we've been able to improve our solutions significantly which provide an intangible return that, a, that a, a company just going in and looking at it from a peer return on investment uh, as far as uh, to the bottom line, you need to look at those int intangible benefits. And we've seen significant intangible, intangible benefits because of our, of our involvement in these projects as well as others. Thanks very much, Bryn. Uh, judging by the, the background glitches and noises, I think we've been rejoined by uh, <laughs> Nana, uh, I, who I've already in introduced, although I, she probably didn't hear my introduction. So uh, thanks for uh, joining us again, Nana. Um, uh, with Colin Def, uh, based out of, of Ghana. Um, we've heard the, the overview from our experts here in, in Washington about some of the big issues around uh, land reform. Perhaps you could give us a, a, an overview of some of the main challenges uh, in Ghana uh, around land uh, some of the, and over some of the different uh, tenure systems and stat statutory versus customary and so on. Uh, and also why, in your, in your view, it's so important to clarify these issues for Ghana's uh, economic uh, development. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry for this technical hiccup. I, I don't know what happened. Just at the time when I was about to speak, the line went off. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. That's okay. <laughs> yes. Um, as you mentioned, Hollander briefly is an organization based in Ghana that works to support interventions to strengthen land tenure security. Our focus is mainly for land access at the customary level. So that our intention is that those who engage in the land sector at the customary level, at all levels of interest, would have their security of tenure guaranteed. And why are we so much interested in interventions at the customary level? You know, Ghana operates a dual system of land governance. There is the state system and there is also the customary system. Records have it that about 80% of the total land area in Ghana is under the customary system. What this means is that when we talk about the quantum of transactions on land, then you will see that a lot of it happens at the customary level. The duality comes in in the sense that when anyone who wants to engage in the land market engages on a bilateral negotiation with any traditional institution, then that person or that entity has the obligation to pass on to the state system where there is registration, where there is regulation of development, where there is planning and all of that. 
And so you can never complete your land transactions only at the customary level. You will by all means have to move on to the state system where registration, documentation, and all of that is done. But that is where the difficulties are. The bilateral negotiation itself is cumbersome in the sense that there is unclarity of ownership of the land in the customary system. So when one is engaging, one runs the risk of knowing who the right owner is and whom to engage. Within the Ghanaian system, there are all kinds of traditional institutions that come with different configurations. And so as you move in from one traditional area in Ghana to another, you are likely to engage with different levels of traditional authority. Some are called schools, some are called kings, some are called families. How do I know whether the area I am engaging in is a family land area or a school land area? It is left to the individual or the entity to find out. So it creates a lot of complexities even for that level of engagement. And so you, you end up sometimes ending in the hands of some unscrupulous people who try to, you know, make some gains from this absence of public information. The other issue within the customer system is the fact that even though there are diversity of traditional authorities, there is one most powerful characteristic, which is the absence of documentation or records on the land transactions. So a particular traditional authority has oversight responsibility for a large tract of area, but does not have any accurate records on what kind of transactions have occurred on the land over time, the content of those transactions, and periods for which those transactions will expire. And so sometimes you end up getting situations where the same parcel of land are given to two or three people who do not know that such transactions have occurred with other people. So it is quite difficult to really get clarity on what it is you are going in for, how much it is going to fetch for you, and even the nature of security you have for what you negotiate for. The other issue is about the registration. As I mentioned, even if someone is so fortunate to have clarity at the customary level and so is now prepared to move on to the system of registration. That is also another big hurdle that creates a lot of challenges. Ghana operates two systems. We have the, the title registration and the deed registration. Title registration is considered as a more um, secure type of registration. And so it is being encouraged. Yet, up until now in Ghana, we started title registration since 1986. And some, some more than, you know, 10 years now, we are still doing title registration only in Accra and Tema, which are the biggest cities, and some parts in Kumasi, which is the second largest city in Ghana. All the rest of the country still fall under deed registration. So for many people who engage in the land market, there is confusion as to which type of registration I qualify to do. And so you hear people misusing the, the, the terms, oh, I have a title, I have a title. But you go into it and you realize that it is only a deed registration. Beyond that, there are a number of agencies involved in the land registration system. All of these perform different functions to complete the process of registration. But you would be surprised that on the streets of Ghana, the average educated person does not even understand where to go for which service because those services are more or less shrouded in some kind of ambiguity. So all they know is that when you have um, a land transaction completed at the local level, you go to a place where you do your registration. Yet there are the survey divisions, there is a survey division, there is a title registration division, there is a deed division, 
and so on and so forth. These unclarities create some problems, and so people end up sending their documents to places where they are not supposed to send. And in the end, they lose the, the document. Because of that complexity also, you have a lot of, you know, corruption. Because then officers who are working now have the option to say that I can take your documents through the process for you. And then you really have to say something besides the official fee. Because of this complexity, what many people do is that after they finish the bilateral negotiation at the customary level, they end it. They don't move ahead to the title registration or deed registration because it's difficult. It's financially inaccessible for many. And even geographically, it's also inaccessible for many. And so they end up there. But that is where also the problems come because then there is an absence of public information on that kind of transaction that has occurred at the customary level. And so when there are issues of compulsory acquisition by state or by some other organization, then you don't have any documents to support your ownership or even to describe the kind of ownership you have in the land. And so issues of compensation become very clumsy for such individuals. So there are quite a lot of problems. Not the least, it's also to mention the fact that, you know, because we operate the dual system, you have some interest in land or some rights in land that are purely emanating from the customary system. A typical example is the customary freehold interest. Our laws in Ghana, until recently, did not allow the registration of such an interest in land. So it is difficult for some of these interests, which are customary, to be transferred into documentation and registration. Yet the reality is that a lot of the land users at the local level depend on these customary interests for their survival and for their economic activity on the land. And so an absence of registration or documentation for such rights Create difficulties for them for sustained engagement with the land, for assured security of tenure, and for you know economic livelihood. Because of this, which is not exhaustive anyway, but because of our time, Holland has committed itself to devote attention to public education. Because we believe that matters, the issues are national issues. It requires local action. And when people are themselves empowered to understand the system they are working with, to understand the mechanisms that are in place, no matter how defective they are, if they know this is a system to protect the security of tenure I can have, then in their own capacity, they will take up that responsibility to move on. So Colombia's embark on public education, awareness creation on land laws and land rights, focusing on the system that operates in Ghana, the legal and regulatory framework, the institutional arrangements, explaining to them what institutions are available and who does what, where, and how. Apart from that, Colombia is also involved in institutional strengthening where we work with a traditional authority, which is a very significant institution in land administration in Ghana, helping them to understand the dynamics occurring in the land market now and how they can strengthen their institutions to support the current dynamics. The particular issue we work with with the traditional institutions is the need to mainstream gender in land administration at their level. So we educate them, we do a lot of training for them. We also help them to package their system in such a way that it becomes the type that supports security of tenure. For example, one typical thing we've been doing with them is what we call the community-based land administration system, where we design a simplified format for documenting land transactions so that it is tailored to the customary arrangement for the particular traditional area. 
and it is institutionalized so that every transaction that goes on at the customary level is recorded in such simplified format. Our justification is that it is better to have such a simplified system if we are not able to assess what is happening at the regional and national level. Having such a system is a fair step to help protect the interests of those who have engaged in such transactions, at least up to a level, in as much as the traditional authority itself has recognized and institutionalized such an arrangement. Well, Apart so, from that... Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Nana. There's a slight delay on, on, on the line there, but uh, you've given us a very... Uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, overview of, of the real complexities of the situation and, and regarding land in so many levels there and a, a little bit of an overview of, of Colin Def's work as well and we'll come back to you uh, shortly but I want to go uh, round to our uh, panelists here in, in Washington as well and follow up uh, with a, a couple more uh, okay. questions and, and Jolene first first back to you um, you know, before Landesa, you worked with uh, the uh, MCC uh, uh, for, for a long time as well. And, and so, with, you know, putting together all of that experience you've had, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in explaining to us here some of the sort of lessons learned uh, from your perspective of working with uh, uh, governments, working with uh, local institutions such as the one that Nano is, is working with, and, and also with, uh, with Trimble, the likes of you know, some of the private companies are involved in this sphere as well. So perhaps you could kind of give us a, a, a sense of best practice, lessons learned, things to avoid, uh, and, and something like that. Sure, I'd love to do that. Mm. Um, let me start with uh, speaking about uh, country partners. Um, through the lens of MCC's core philosophy of country ownership, because I think country ownership writ large makes a big difference in effectiveness of development programs, but particularly in this area of land tenure, where land tenure goes to the core of societal issues, it goes to the core of political issues, and it goes to the core of economic issues. So um, some of the challenges and failures that we've seen in the past when we worked on land issues were precisely because we weren't taking a country-owned approach that allowed for some of the understandings needed in those particularly political and social domains to be effectively built into the way we were approaching reform. Um, and I, you know, I think from the very beginning, the fact that in MCC's country-owned model, um, the request for programming in a particular area, including land tenure, um, is demand-driven. It comes from the country itself, not just the government, but the government through a broad consultative process with civil society organizations like NANAs, with private sector firms from their own country and private sector firms from outside their country. And so when I think 11 of the, uh, when I was working at MCC, there was, CC, there was something like 11 or 12 um, land projects out of a portfolio of 18 or 19 compacts. And to me, that is a big statement about political will towards reforming these issues. And, that political will starting point is non-trivial. Uh, you know, again, in the past when World Bank or USAID, where I also used to work for many years before MCC, went in a country and said, we want to work on land tenure with you and here's how we think we should do it. Often you would put programs in place, but they wouldn't effectively move forward because the government really wasn't ready and really hadn't bought in, really hadn't consulted with its own um, members of society about how and what they wanted to do. And so it's a different starting point and I find that it makes a tremendous difference. And I point out particularly Madagascar and Burkina Faso um, as examples where MCC went into those countries at a point where the governments themselves through long policy uh, debates internal to the country had come to the conclusion and were on the uh, verge of passing very broad and very um, forward-looking comprehensive land policy reforms that's an ideal point to come in with a big program of $36 million like MCC did in Madagascar to try to push that will and that policy reform into implementation and getting down to land titling to uh, the information system solutions, et cetera. Um, MCC has also invested in some countries that where the demand was there, but maybe the political will in the sense of those two policy examples wasn't quite there. For example, <coughs> Stuart Tata worked a lot with us in, as did Trimble in Benin. At the end of the day, the Benin progress under MCC was very good, but it was a much harder struggle in Benin because the various parts of the government and the dialogues needed with their stakeholders hadn't really happened in terms of what types of reform and where do we want to go with 
approaching customary systems and, and harmonizing those in law with statutory. Where do we want to go with information systems? Who needs, what, are we going to decentralize the land registry or not? Those decisions hadn't been made um, and that complicated the ability to roll out and, and implement you know, a, a similar size program as we had in Madagascar. Um, and <clears throat> finally, another example that, <clears throat> or another piece of the country ownership and the partnership, I think is you really get the best of people like myself, Mark Winter, folks around the table who um, have been able and had the fortune to look at these issues around the world and be, us being able to come into a country where perhaps the people in the driver's seat haven't seen a particular approach or um, issue yet and they're confronting it. They don't know what worked in another country that had a similar issue and maybe a similar context to theirs and what didn't work. Um, yet what they do know is precisely common sense in their country, precisely what political strategies are going to work, precisely what are the ways that can work to mitigate risks, what are the vulnerabilities, what's, what are the right stakeholders. And so when you put together international lessons learned with that local knowledge and that local knowledge being in, in, a, in a context of political will, you really can get some powerful uh, results. And sometimes it also takes, um, I won't pretend it's easy, sometimes it takes you know, the, the twinning of sort of a collegial partnership. So I'm your peer, and that's what country ownership buys you is a space where the donor and the country are peers. And so we have a professional collegial where we can talk about technical issues, but also sometimes the donor, like MCC, having to say, like we did in our Nicaragua project, look, this project is failing. It's really not working. And here's why we think, you know, what we think are the problems, but you have to fix it or we're going to stop funding. And so MCC didn't say, here's the solution. They said, here's the problem. We're really concerned. We're about to cut this activity off. You have a certain amount of time to go consult with your stakeholders, figure out in your own context a solution path. And they did. This was before the bigger political issue came up in Nicaragua where we had to close down the project. But before that, just some of the one of the mill types of pro project problems that happen commonly in development, there, was, there were some real problems. And we were able to use country ownership to say, get a much more effective solution track, and one which was bought into and quite actively and promptly sort of put into action so that then the project went forward. Um, let me talk a bit about private firms, because I think that's an exciting new dimension in, in um, the whole arena of land tenure reform and property rights systems. Um, and I want to talk about it from a couple of angles. The first one, and I'll just be very brief on this, is the private sector using their voice and their leverage to help create the political will that I just spoke about. Um, and I, you know, there, there is a small but growing number of private firms who are out there um, trying to create awareness. And Stuart Title has been doing this for a long time. Tremble is now growing its presence. Esri, I think, has also spoken into this issue quite a bit. Um, but there's room for, for much more of that. So if, if we believe what we just said, that earlier in the panel, all three of us said, you know, this stuff gets in the way of productive economic growth and opportunities for private sector come along with economic growth. If we believe that, then it ought to be in a general, it ought to be on the agenda of private sector firms to speak to their peers in governments where they're trying to do business, to speak to their business partners about getting this agenda on the attention of, of, of the politicians and others who are in a position to make reforms. I'm re I was really pleased to see on the heels of maybe a couple of years of heated debate about what's called responsible agribusiness investment, a lot, which is the, the, the twin side of the land grabs issue that we talked about. And I was really pleased to learn this fall that a group of private sector investors, including TIA CREF, have now gone out on their own and announced that they are subscribing to a set of principles of responsible agribusiness investment, which include paying attention to the land rights issues when they're going into land acquisitions. And so that's a really good example where some major players in the private sector can come out and make an effective statement about this issue area. Um, some private philanthropic organizations are also starting to realize that those branches of, of the private money can effectively help support reforms, and particularly supporting NGO efforts um, that may not be supported as robustly through public sector programs. So um, Landessa, for example, gets 80% of its funding from private sector and only 20% from contract business with, with the US government and the World Bank and others. And I think that's a growing arena also. On the, on the, the most exciting angle, I think, is really 
what we're starting to see in a few places, and again, some of the folks here, like Stuart and Trimble, are at the cutting edge of this, and there's, there's a few other kind of entrepreneurs that are out there trying to say, in fact, <coughs> if you look at the A to Z of what needs to be changed and what needs to be done better um, in the arena of making land rights effective, maybe uh, G to Z should and ought to be done by the private sector, and right now it's being done by the public sector. So, you know, things like mapping land, things like helping people put together their dossier of paperwork and evidence that needs to be submitted to the government for it to be formalized can and is starting to be done by private actors, whether it's a for-profit firm or NGOs. And I think that's an exciting arena that we need to, to pay more attention to. Some of the reasons that hasn't rolled out faster, I think uh, my colleague from Trimble touched a little bit about. One is sort of a time horizon. So a uh, private sector has a business bottom line to pay attention to. That often isn't as patient, patient as development capital. <laughs> um, and so there's a time horizon. It would be interesting to ask uh, you know, the folks here from Trimble and Stewart to talk a little bit about why they have decided that it's worth having the patients making investments now, understanding that there are market opportunities that will emerge later on from those same early investments. Um, there's some issues in terms of private-public partnerships. There's some tricky areas that you know, MCC and others are starting to figure out, and that you know, how do you how do you have an alliance with a private sector that doesn't sort of violate procurement rules um, on on these kind of development projects? So there's some practical nuts and bolts types of things, and just one last word in terms of uh, sort of collaboration with um, donors. Yes, yeah, so I can talk maybe too much about this stuff, but I think it's important. You know, people often you know, worry about you know, different donors sort of taking different approaches, and there have been times in the past when World Bank, USAID, others have been in a particular country, like back in the 80s when I was in Honduras, sort of advising at odds about the same policy issues. It's been a lot of progress on coming up with a harmonization of donor perspectives and common lesson learning, and that's a good thing, but the best thing is when <coughs> countries like Madagascar take, country, take the donor coordination into their hands and create a land reform program under which all donors have to put their assistance. And that creates a common framework that causes that kind of shared approaches. Um, and then there's also the nuts and bolts, just like I said, with um, regard to private sector. A really good example in Mozambique where MCC came in and wanted to support something called the Mozambique Community Land Initiative, which was really working with customary communities to help them help themselves get their land rights secured. And uh, quickly, uh, there was a, it was a program that was funded by seven different donors, and MCC wanted to contribute. Quickly ran into, you know, the U.S. government doesn't do basket funding. We don't, give, we don't give budget support. We don't do basket funding. So how can we make this work? And we essentially were able to come up with a parallel structure on the mechanics, so where our money, which bank account our money was in, what kind of procurement rules, but one which was harmonized and was governed by an overarching conceptual framework that all the donors subscribed to. So it was the same exact program. It was governed by the same steering committee, but mechanically it ran through different channels. So we found a way to do it, but those things have to be thought through and get in the way. So it's important. Nuts and bolts are important, I guess, as well. And Great. Well, Ben, turning to you uh, with your USAID uh, hat on, uh, part of the work that you uh, did in, uh, for this interagency group uh, focused on Ghana had a set of uh, specific recommendations for uh, you know, what the U.S. can do, what's the value added of the U.S. Uh, uh, engagement on these issues of, uh, of land reform, land security. Perhaps you could uh, you know, explain what you think the U.S. has to offer in this area from a government perspective. Okay, well, I, let me start by saying I think that our, our work in this area was a good illustration of sort of the evolving philosophy um, of, of land tenure interventions that's happened over the last few decades. Um, back in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, donors and governments used to try to address these issues usually through these large-scale systematic uh, land titling programs, which often didn't have the intended result. Uh, Jolene talked a little bit about that. Um, but uh, these were you know, not, not particularly effective, sometimes even counterproductive, certainly not cost-effective in terms of generating the kinds of, uh, of outcomes that were, that were hoped for. Um, why, why didn't these kinds of things work? Well, for one reason is that um, a lot of the, the, uh, the governments of the countries where these initiatives were taking place uh, had low capacity, right? Um, uh, uh, didn't really have the, um, 
the capability to enforce property rights in a lot of cases. They weren't able to maintain updated property registries, resolve disputes, things like that. Um, and, and the bottom line is that if the government can't enforce the rules, right, then a land title is, is just a piece of paper. Right? A land title is completely meaningless if there's nothing behind it. And I think that's kind of the lesson that we've learned. There's certainly other, um, other factors there, particularly uh, that we've learned to kind of recognize the customary system and try to work within the customary system in, uh, in doing these kinds of things. Um, but to, to sort of summarize that evolution that's taken place, I think we still see an important role for registration and document, documentation of rights. We still see that as an important uh, part of the process. But equally, if not more important, is, is a whole set of other processes, such as building and strengthening government institutions, right? Um, uh, doing this through a process that local actors are engaged in, that local actors buy into. Uh, building awareness of property rights among the people who, who have them, um, and making sure that, that formal systems build on customary systems and work in, in concert with them. Okay, so that was sort of the perspective that I think our recommendations reflected and also what I think some of the other donors in Ghana have been doing. And just to give a couple of examples very briefly of what other donors have been doing, um, MCC has piloted a process of effective and, and efficient uh, land registration uh, that's gone along with uh, large-scale public awareness campaigns as well as uh, institutional strengthening, particularly at the local level. Uh, another major donor in Ghana in the, in the land sector is the World Bank, which has had a couple of major programs that, that uh, in total have, have represent over $100 million in investments. Um, and those have been for things like supporting legal reforms. They've also supported a process of uh, codifying customary systems, so essentially trying to understand the customary rules in different places and, uh, and, and regularize those and put those down on, on paper um, to make them clear. Um, they've also, the World Bank has also done other, other kinds of institutional strengthening capacity building, a lot of working on uh, dispute resolutions. So when our interagency group met to, to talk about what we could do, um, you know, we, we recommended not, not to engage in some kind of huge, you know, uh, uh, monolithic titling program like we might have recommended 30 years ago, but rather we recommended to sort of build on these existing efforts by donors and to try to use our, our uh, U.S. government resources as cost-effectively as possible. Um, and uh, two particular interventions that I'll talk about uh, that, we, that we recommended one was to provide support for an institution in Ghana called Customary Land Secretariats. And these are uh, community level organizations that essentially help traditional authorities uh, with the the day-to-day the, uh, -day tasks of land administration, right? With things like recording rights, with, with um, uh, updating records and things like that. So these are a set, this is essentially the land administration system within the customary system. Um, and there's been evidence that these institutions have worked very well in some cases, but that they've been underfunded. So we recommended um, uh, working with the customary land secretariats to provide them with more training, with more equipment, um, and to sort of modernize the way that they're, that they're recording and, and registering these rights that are administered by traditional authorities. Uh, the, a, second, a second recommendation we had that I'll highlight was to support a participatory and inclusive process of demarcating boundaries between communities. Um, and this is, this is a big issue in Ghana uh, because often it's not clear which traditional authority has jurisdiction over which area and the boundaries are not clearly defined. And so this can lead to, to conflicts between communities, particularly as they're growing and particularly as people are expanding the areas where they settle. Uh, and, and this is sort of a growing problem in Ghana. And we particularly highlighted this one because as population pressures increase, right, this is something that's gonna get worse and worse. And so we think that, that stepping in now and, uh, and, and sort of, uh, uh, Establishing clear records and, and clear demarcation of, of which communities where and which traditional authority has jurisdiction where would be an important contribution and something that could save a lot of potential trouble down the road. Thanks very much. And uh, Bryn, uh, over to you. Uh, one of the sort of uh, overarching themes of this uh, series of events we're holding is, is how to kind of leverage the private sector more effectively in, in uh, 
US uh, development policy and, and, and practice. So from your perspective and Trimble's work uh, in Africa and, and elsewhere, um, you know, how, how do you think that the US government can sort of work more effectively to assist you in what you do and also to, to further its development agenda at the same time? So actually today I think both the World Bank and the MCC do an excellent job at uh, promoting technology transfer. Um, and they really look at technology as a productivity multiplier and not technology to re replace the land administration process. So I guess I would like to applaud both for their support in, in technology. I think if you look at land administration from a pure mathematical perspective, the math behind land administration probably hasn't changed since the time of Gauss. But if you look at just in the last 50 years, the technology used in land administration has increased productivity or has the ability to increase productivity by thousands of percent and improve quality by 50 or greater percent. So I think what is important for government and the private sector and the private sector being those who develop technology as well as utilize technology need to sit down together so that we from the private sector can give uh, input into what our solutions do and how they can be adapted to the land administration processes of a specific country or region and where they can improve productivity and, and where they may not uh, because in some cases they may not. So uh, I think a, a healthy dialogue on what solutions are available today and how they're different of the solutions in the past is one important aspect. I think uh, the second place where I think government can engage private sector more is actually in the industry segments. And, and when I say industry segments, I mean mining or utilities or construction. Um, today, they have a lot of use for a multi-use cadastre. They have a lot of use for many of the technology solutions uh, that we use from a land administration perspective. They also have a lot of background in that area. So I think partnering with those, whether it be mining companies or utility consortiums or construction companies, they can provide us valid input and also can potentially be sponsors and assist us in developing uh, land administration for a country or region. Um, third, I think today if we look at uh, uh, land administration, I look at primarily U.S. government, you know, there are many U.S. government agencies today, like the Corps of Engineers, U.S. Coast Guard, National Geodetic Survey, who have used this technology and used it through its evolution, where it's come in the last 20 years, uh, consistently in doing their work. And I think uh, the federal government can really leverage from a U.S. perspective leverage their knowledge in the review of proposals and the review of technology because they've used it uh, for the last two decades in many of the applications we look at today from a land administration process. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions in a couple of minutes, but just want to uh, give Nana an, another chance to uh, give us a, a brief comment on, on really from your perspective, uh, Ghana's received uh, a lot of assistance uh, from uh, World Bank, multilateral institutions, from private sector and other government actors as well. Uh, but, you know, from your point of view, what are the most useful things that, uh, that donor governments and, and private companies can can do to help uh, to help uh, resolve some of these tr really tricky issues on, on land tenure. Um, what are the gaps uh, in your mind, the most important gaps that have to be filled still? Well, thank you very much. I think um, the main points that really need attention are already highlighted by the first two speakers. But what I would want to add is the fact that what has been started needs to be sustained. For example, let's talk about the Rural Land Title Registration by MCC. It is a very beautiful effort. It has yielded very good results. But it's really limited in terms of the areas where this has happened. It is important that for us to achieve impact, we expand and we deepen what we do in this um, project. Talking about the legal reform under the World Bank Lab project, 
Um, it has taken a while, but I think we have made some progress in discussing various provisions that should go into the new land bill to reflect the current dynamics. But again, it is still at the national level, so to say. But if we really want impact, the dialogue, the consultation should really happen also at the local level where action is taking place. So it is a good effort, but it needs further deepening down the level where people actually are able to make the inf uh, in input into it to tailor it to their needs. I couldn't agree more when the um, first speaker talked about the need for enforcement. A link to that is a system, strengthening of gov government institutions. These are very key. But when we talk about strengthening of government institutions, we should also not forget about strengthening of the traditional institutions. Because as I have mentioned, a large part of land transactions are managed by the traditional institutions. So if we are talking about land tenure security and we focus on strengthening government institutions without paying equal attention to the traditional institutions at the customary level, then we end up creating that imbalance. We have strong government institutions with very low level capacity local institutions. And that will perpetuate the kind of delink that we have had in the system. So yes, certain government institutions, but pay equal attention to the traditional institutions. Especially at this point in time when we all agree that it is not possible to totally do away with the traditional institutions. We still have to work with them, and so we need to strengthen them as well. Christ, Christ. In relation to the private sector, I just have two quick comments. And what I would like to say is that, yes, the involvement of the private sector is critical because the land sector is a highly technical area, and so we would need the technical expertise of the private sector. But I think we also need to acknowledge that now the land discussion is much more than just a technical discussion. It's also a development subject which requires some development skills in managing the issues around it. Which, in many, many cases, from experience, sec private sector people do not approach it from that angle. And so we end up having technologies in place which are not tailored to the needs of the local people or the people who have to use it. Or we end up having systems that are too complicated to manage looking at the issues we need to uh, work on. And so, yes, private sector involvement, but private sector blended with the development approach in dealing with the land question so that we are actually able to manage what really is relevant to address the issue of land tenacity. Thank you. Well, look, we've got a few minutes left for, uh, for some questions. Um, please introduce yourself and give your affiliation, and there'll be mics going around so uh, Nana can hear the questions as well. So let's, uh, <laughs> as you, the gentleman at the back had his hand up first, so let's, uh, let's take him, and then we'll take a couple of others as well. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Rabley, formerly of International Land Systems, now of Thomson Reuters. Um, I was a little disappointed in the title of the uh, talk today, because I thought I'd gone back 20 years see land title in the title. I thought we'd moved on to continuum of land rights and something a little more reflective of the complexity of what we're trying to deal with. Um, I was disappointed not to see more discussion about authority. Uh, land rights and the protection of land rights is dependent upon the authority that stands behind it, whether that's a family, a customary environment, or the statutory environment. And the governance of that authority is critical. We can mention all the other things, but those two are essential to me. Um, I think we need to be careful in claiming lots of research and evidence. I think if you look at our sector, it's very thin compared to many others. The best data set is still Peru, the best longitudinal data set, and that's probably barely even 20 years. And that's the one that's kicking forward some of these new findings about particularly women's societal um, security and so forth. I was very happy to see Bryn talk about all this wonderful work that they're doing in Ghana. And I agree, technology has made tremendous strides. In fact, uh, 
There's a wonderful Casio phone uh, uh, camera for $250 with built-in GPS. And there's a wonderful new iPhone 4S that has both uh, Russian satellites and our own GPS, which are fantastic data collection devices that are extremely cheap for us to use in the field. So the, the question that I have actually is specifically for Trimble, and as a member of the private sector, of course, future revenue stream is always key for anything that we do. When could we expect a sub-1,000, sub-meter collection device that we can use both in the rural and the urban areas? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir, I'll take a question right at the front now. So me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm with Adna here in Washington, but I'm from Ghana. Um, I want Richard to invite me back, so I'll slice my question to very short. I appreciate <laughs> I, that. <laughs> I know that um, the overall theme for this uh, event and the series is on development. But I will ask you not to forget other important issues like democracy and governance, especially when Benjamin mentioned the potential for conflict. I could give you lots of stories about land-related conflict in just Accra and Kumasi and Western region mining. So my question is, can you see an area, areas where we will need to sort of downgrade the development principle and say, in this instance, uh, issues of social justice and democracy and, and, and even group rights should be elevated above uh, growth issues. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take uh, one more question immediately uh, behind, uh, behind you there. Thank you. John Harbison from uh, yep. <laughs> John Harbison, John Hobson, John Hopkins, sorry, so I want to pick up the last speaker's point. First of all, I want to say preliminary, nice to see a couple of Madison PhDs uh, <laughs> on the program. <laughs> Wisconsin used to have a land tenure center, which was the, the, the leading the edge and it needs to restore. I don't think enough attention has been paid to, to the equities in this, to sort of the equities, the political equity, the land conflicts, the overlapping rights. That's the preliminary, it's not the answer. It's really conflict management. Uh, the countries I know best are Ethiopia and Kenya, where the land situation are, are a total catastrophe in those countries. There's no, how do you, the, the question of, of historic injustices, the question of displaced persons, the question of inheritance rights, and how do you do it? I mean, I just don't think there's enough attention to pay the okay, great. Well, let's take uh, those set of questions. Um, Bryn, perhaps you can respond to the, the, the first one, and then uh, the rest of you can kind of fill in some of the gaps that we haven't, we've not talked to about and, and definitely talk about this issue of, of conflict uh, and conflict risk and conflict management as well. But Bryn, over to you first. So I think if you look over the last 20 years from a GPS perspective, you've seen a significant uh, change in the price point. Uh, I can't remember if you said sub thousand dollars or it was what you know I think you'll find the industry is approaching that for certain capability um, uh, from a pure technology perspective um, really GPS alone or GLONASS alone or Galileo alone or whatever satellite based system you want to take uh, is really of no value without the application software around it and uh, I think whether it be ourselves or Trimble or others, we spent a significant amount of time of going from here's the signal to applying that signal, that satellite signal, to doing a piece of work. Because uh, the piece of work is not just the position. So on your iPhone 4S, you probably can get, you know, I'm guessing, a couple meters probably uh, from a, a positioning perspective. Um, when will you see the iPhone 4S? Uh, Less than that, um, I don't know is the answer. But if I look at the technology curve, just in the 25 years that I've been in the surveying industry, you know, when I started, we were looking, the way we positioned ourselves was with the theodolite, looking at the stars, and, and really from that, doing an astral positioning. Just in those 25 years, 
we went from that to be able to get a centimeter real-time position you know, on the order of $10,000, $15,000. So you know, we've seen a significant change. I think demand is going to drive it more. I think the, commo you know, the commoditization of position is going to drive it more. Uh, when it's exactly sub $1,000, I really don't know. Uh, I think you're seeing solutions that are actually approaching that at different levels of accuracy today. I can't give you a specific, I'm sorry. So uh, let me jump in and um, maybe talk first on Peter's questions and comments and then maybe the other two t together because they were similar in what they were asking. So I have to say that I had the same reaction to the title, but I didn't make a comment or talk about that issue because um, to my pleasant surprise, the moderator in introducing this did not fall into that trap and rather talked about land tenure and mentioned some of the complexities. And so for those of you who are, don't know what Peter and I are talking about, the, you know, there, there was a time period and to some extent there are some maybe very senior people who still maybe have this simplistic understanding that you know, what we call a land title, for example, here in the United States, um, which in some places, like in the French-speaking world, um, really relates to very, a very specific kind of right over land, which is fee simple individual ownership. And what has, there's been a great realization since back in the 1980s where most of the programs were literally going out and doing that kind of titling, that we need also to pay attention to, understand, and find ways to record and secure communal types of tenure, um, uh, in, even individual tenures that might be leaseholds, might be use rights. Um, when you're, for example, in Benin, when you're giving an ownership title, there's a need to also recognize and somehow make secure secondary rights of use, for example, harvesting or going, you know, taking cattle across a piece of land. So there's a, land rights are not a monolith of ownership. There's a whole panoply of types of rights and they're all valid. Even here in the United States, we have condominiums, we have cooperatives, we have all kinds of things. The basic point is they need to be secure and effective. So, you know, the, the uh, Cape Town, South Africa, does not have fee simple ownership titles, but they have a wonderful economy because their leasehold rights are secure and efficiently transactable. So I think that's the innuendo that Peter was referring to, and we as professionals tend, therefore, when we come up with titles to sessions, not to use the word land titling, but something that captures some of that robustness. Um, I will just use that as a segue to a point on technology where um, you know, some of the same problems with technology coming in and p maybe not offering picking up on what Nana said, not sort of offering kind of solutions that are robust in some of the same ways. And there has been a tremendous effort in the last few years to, for example, find ways to create a data map solution for land information systems that can record multiple rights of over the same piece of property, can report, re record lineage, can record, I mean, simple things like having the form of a document, whether it's a title or something else, having two spaces, so the man's name and the woman's name could be on it. Those are real things that weren't happening. Um, and so, so there are technological innovations that are coming along that are lining up with some of this more robust reality. On the question of authority, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, I, I stated at a very general <coughs> level on purpose, and in some ways, when I was referring to political will and the issues of having a policy framework in place, many of the issues, whether it's the question of whether the whether the authorities for making decisions on allocation of land, whether it's the management of the data over land, whether it's the authorization who's signing the title, is happening at the local or state or national level are critical issues that need to be figured out and over which there are significant arguments. Benin's one of the, that was one of the very precise issues in Benin that took quite a while in our program for the policy process with stakeholders involved to really come to an agreement and a consensus on the direction it was supposed to take. So don't disagree. Um, and I think that's also when we were talking a bit about you know, how can government partner with private sector, your own experience in your pilot project in Ghana, which is one of the few where you know, Peter as a private entrepreneur is taking on some of the, you know, we can offload from the government and do as a private service some of these pieces of a land registration. Um, one of the key issues and with you and with one of your peers that's doing something similar in Ghana is precisely um, the question of authority, right? So if you can create a database and record people's claims to rights and it gives a socially legitimate database, but when does the question of the government legitimizing and recognizing those paralegal titles or certificates that come out of a private 
registry, registry effort, when does that have to happen so that they can have the full impact that they might have? Um, on the evidence, I, I don't agree with you that Peru is the only or the best data set. I do agree with you that the evidence is still too thin, but relative to where it was before, there is a growing body of evidence. There's some very compelling studies from Ethiopia, from Uganda. I just read about another study from Uganda. Um, some of the domestic violence literature I'm seeing coming out of Southeast Asia, where Landessa puts a lot of time. Um, and uh, you know, so you know, some of the, I guess my point in saying that is there is a growing body of increasingly rigorous evidence that is pointing towards these results. And I think those match up with our intuitive understanding and the practical kind of constraints that those of us who have been practicing development for a long time. So I feel confident saying that even though you've heard me in many other settings say, you know, be careful with the evidence because first of all, just because Tidal gave credit in Thailand doesn't mean there's going to be a credit market impact in many other places. And so there's some people who might take a bit of evidence and sort of generalize way too much. And that's part of the caveat I was trying to make. And then just to put something interesting from MCC, one of the things about MCC's model is that it built in impact evaluations from the beginning of its programs. So pretty soon now we're going to have a whole bunch more studies coming out of these big grant programs that MCC put in place. And it'll be interesting to watch that evidence and see what it tells us both in terms of what is and what isn't working. So I encourage all of you to try to watch those. Most of the projects are coming to into their last year. So pretty soon we should be seeing some further evidence. On the democracy and governance, um, couldn't agree more. I think, I, I guess, I, in, ter in terms of land conflict being understood, I mentioned it at the level of broad civil war and conflict. It's very often a trigger or kind of a kindling in there. But I think in, in the context of what we're talking about here, it's also very important to realize that the process of recording rights, of giving a title or something else, can often surface conflicts and feed into them. And so what we've learned to do more or less well, depends on which country and who's doing the programs, is to try to build in dispute mediation into the programmatic approaches. And just for example, in MCC's program in Burkina Faso, one of the things that they've decided to do precisely because of that is kind of do a community-based land use mapping prior to doing any documentation of individual or family or clan lands so that you, the communities can come to agreement and sort of map out this is where the cattle corridors are going. This is where people are farming land. This is where this, the property of the school is going to sort of be. And that, you know, that process creates a dialogue that um, helps solve some conflicts that are there and then sets the stage so that when documentation of rights happen, perhaps there's fewer conflicts. Um, and that, that same program also has built in a whole approach to looking at authority around conflict resolution and trying to both build into law and practice a way to take traditional and customary <coughs> means of resolving disputes and link them to the formal ju judicial system and train the judicial system in that so that you have a better process for effectively resolving disputes. Um, it is the 50th anniversary of the Land Tenure Center this year, for those of you who didn't know. Um, I think that's exciting. Um, the question about the equities and sort of can we, should we elevate development, sort of governance and democracy above economics. I get this question a lot in one form or another from civil society in particular. And I particularly don't like it because I think you can't sort of stop the world and fix one problem you know, and then fix the other one. So I think what we really have to do is figure out how to move them, advance them in tandem. And part of that is about paying attention to risks and who the stakeholders are when we go in with these land programs and finding effective ways to deal with those vulnerabilities and those risks. and ensuring that the proper equ equities are in the dialogue about whether it's large-scale land acquisitions or a titling program. So. I could say anything. Yeah, just yeah. add a couple things. I think um, you know, your, your question gets at a very important point, um, which is, you know, this, so, so do we want to pursue property rights purely from the standpoint of maximizing economic growth, right? And the answer is no. Right. What, 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 the, what our task is about is about providing secure property rights for people on the ground. Whether those are group rights, whether those are working through the customary system, uh, that's, that's, that's the point. Um, now that said, is, is, that, is that process at odds with economic growth? I think usually not, right? Usually if you can find a way that to, uh, to help people resolve land conflicts, if you can find a way to um, uh, uh, 
you know, address these kinds of issues, there's going to be an economic growth payoff, right? People are going to be more secure in their investments and, and, uh, and so on. And in terms of the other, uh, the other question also, as far as thinking about the equities and thinking about these, these kinds of issues, I think, um, I don't know if, if Nana is still with us, but in fact, what her organization does is exactly look at those kinds of things. And, and I think our experience shows that you, if you pay attention to it, it's possible to undertake a participatory process of identifying different land uses, identifying different perspectives on land uses and land claims, and sort of working through those at, at, a, at a community level. And it's not perfect, right? It's never, it's never going to be perfect, but that's always something that we have in mind when we do this sort of thing. And as I said, that's what, uh, that's what Calandef really specializes in, is facilitating those kinds of processes. Great. Well, we've given you the lead in, Nana, for the final uh, comment. You have the privilege of the last word uh, today. Um, uh, is there anything you'd like to add, uh, either in response to the questions you've heard or uh, any final point from how you see things on the ground in, in Ghana? Yes, thank you. I'm very sorry, but, you know, I, I didn't get all the questions so clearly. So I wouldn't want to hazard any guess. But from, from the responses given, I guess it was discussing, I mean, the question of what exactly is title and how does title improve um, economic livelihood, if that is correct. But um, for, from the answers, I think I agree to it. The point is, we are not just talking about a piece of paper with the name land title registra registration. No, we are talking about a kind of documentation that explains the type of ownership that any particular entity, be it an individual or a group of people or an organization has in any parcel of land, with the parcel described also vividly pictured and attached to the agreement, so that it becomes binding between the one who has gone in for the parcel and the one giving out the parcel. That is it. Whether we call it title, whether we call it whatever, that is what is needed, at least. So that for the time which the owner is giving out the parcel to the user, there will be that understanding that the user has a right to use it for this number of years. In Ghana, we actually are not so much into discussing what it is about, but we are so much into understanding the fact that if we are able to document what kind of ownership we are talking about, it goes a long way to protect the user. And that is what is important for the local level livelihood issue that we are talking about. So I like the point that was raised that the aim is not just economic growth, but it is about securing property rights for individuals, for group of people, for any entity, for the number of years that is guaranteed. Again, I am so much in love with the issue that Going through participation processes, it is possible to unearth those rights that are inherent within any society so that you work with those rights and help document those rights. For me, that is really one of the big things that is influencing how we are making impact in the sector. Because many a time, we, we, do not, we, we feel that it is a no-go area. It's an untouchable sector that the moment you go to touch that, you want X so many ways. But that is gone. It's far gone. Now we are talking about traditional leaders who are prepared to mobilize their communities to come have a discussion of what rights people have and try to clarify it. So spending a bit of time in participatory processes, it is really possible to understand what particular types of rights and interests in land that pertains in any particular area and work with that. And that, for me, is what I think we need to really highlight in our discussions with donors about interventions in the land sector, that it is not just about doing the policy discussions and legal reforms and things at the national level. While those advances are very important, it is equally important that we spend time going through these participatory processes to get to the bottom of what type of interest exists and use that to even fashion out very good interventions that is still made to address issues on the ground. And for me, that is possible. There are many evidences to show that it works and we can go on to use that approach 
to help streamline the land beneficiary well, thanks very much, uh, Nana. Your love for the subject comes comes across very strongly here in, in the room. Um, I'm afraid we're all uh, out of time now. We've really only been able to scratch the surface of this sort of really big and, and difficult subject. But I hope uh, we can have more sessions like this on, on, on the issue of land. But um, uh, few will rival this one for the quality of the panelists and the speakers. And uh, please join me in, in thanking everyone uh, for uh, taking part today. Thanks very much.